Welcome everyone. Our webinar will begin shortly. Hello, and welcome to the fifth webinar in our effective online instruction series. Today, we'll be talking about recording effective micro lectures. It's great to have so many of you with us today. The turnout is really incredible. My name is Sherry Hughes. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Professional Learning at the American Council, on, Council of Education. As we get started, first, I want to commend everyone across higher education for making this astonishing transition to remote learning in a matter of days in many cases and with a real commitment to our students learning. But we know that moving a course online, like being assigned to a classroom, is just the start. This webinar series emerged to support the next phase of that work to ensure that faculty receive the support they need to ensure that every student has a quality online experience. Our goal in these webinars is to have practical conversations with experts on how to teach well online. So now I'm going to turn things over to Kim Middleton from AQ, who will serve as today's moderator. Thanks so much, Sherry. Welcome to all of you from all of us here at the Association of College and University Educators. I am really delighted to be joined today by two incredibly creative and thoughtful pedagogy experts, and they'll start off our conversation today on the topic recording effective micro lectures. Before I introduce them and get started, however, I'd like to quickly review our agenda for the hour. First, our presenters will briefly discuss the context for this topic. What exactly is a micro lecture and why is it an important online teaching technique? We think that that will be relevant whether you're in your first or your 40th week of your online teaching experience. The majority of today's session, however, about 35 minutes, is reserved for discussion led by the questions that you submit to our panelists. Our goal is to have an interactive conversation that focuses on this topic and that continues to provide practical ideas and suggestions for your online teaching. So a quick word about how to then pose your questions. So if you would please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. As you do, you might see that someone else has submitted a question that's sort of similar to yours. And in that case, you can use that thumbs up symbol to highlight that question. It'll save you some typing and it also helps us prioritize the questions that have the most interest. And then finally, don't forget the chat room window. Throughout today's session, we'll use that as a sort of one-way information space. It will provide references and resources that come up during our discussion. And then finally, if you have technical difficulties, please go ahead and email us at webinar at aq.org for assistance. Towards the end of the hour, we'll share how we can continue our conversation at our online discussion board and uh, share additional resources that will support your teaching. And that will also be the place where you can re review a recording of this session. The topic for today's webinar and for the series as a whole were inspired by the free resources recently published by AQ in our online teaching toolkit. Many of you responded to that kit by telling us that you wanted to hear more, more from our experts and then more from each other about these six topics. And that's why we're here today and we'll continue this conversation again on the discussion boards and in our final session of the series next week. So now, without further ado, I want to introduce our experts. Joining us today are Mike Wesch, Associate Professor of Cultural Anthropology at Kansas State University, and Viji Sathi, Professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I'm Kim Middleton, Academic Director at AQ, 
I am particularly excited to hear these two launch our discussion on this topic after having introduced video and audio projects to both my students and faculty colleagues at the College of St. Rose in New York and Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles. I know that Mike and Vigi have a wealth of insights and expertise that are going to expand all of our practices no matter where we are with this teaching technique. So we're going to dive in. Um, our experts thought it was especially important to begin with a really clear understanding of what a micro lecture is. And so to make that point, what better way is there than to show us one, right? So Mike has made us a video to explain the concept. A video micro lecture is usually under five minutes and focused on one specific concept or skill, making the content easy to find within the structure of a larger course. Famous examples include simple screen recordings like those of Khan Academy, short animated pieces like those of TED-Ed, and the punchy mini lectures of Crash Course. You can also look for inspiration from the many tutorials available on YouTube, rock star edgy tubers like Mark Rober, and even travel tubers can offer something to aspire to if you're an anthropologist like me. I've been doing short form videos professionally for about 13 years. I started with some educational screen captures. I then started inviting my students in to collaborate to make some short cultural commentaries. Later, I learned how to animate so I could tell some short stories. And most recently, I've started taking my camera out into the world to share my ethnographic field experiences with my students. I think video is a huge piece of our future as professors. It is the new PowerPoint, and I want to do whatever I can to help other faculty master this, not just because it will improve their classes, but because ultimately, I think it will unleash a tremendous wave of outstanding educational content into the world. A video micro lecture Yeah, and I'll just briefly say something real quick here. Uh, I thought I should do a micro lecture sort of about uh, just talking on camera because talking on camera can actually be one of the biggest barriers to doing a micro lecture. And you don't necessarily have to be on camera, but I wanted to give you an example of uh, what that looks like and why it's hard and maybe help you get on camera if that's hard for you. Hi, <clears throat> hi, I'm Mike Wesh, and I'm going to show you how to make a video for your class. Hey, George, you in here? Hi, I'm Mike Wesh, and I'm going to show you how to make a video for your class. This is going to be a super simple video, and you don't need a lot of special equipment. In fact, you only need three things. You're just going to need a nice big light source. And as you can see, I'm just actually using this nice big window I have here. You're going to need some sort of way of holding your camera steady. So I'm just using some duct tape, and I'm just using a Google Pixel. This is a 2016 model. It retails for about $65 on eBay. And as you can see, you can actually get a pretty good looking shot, even with cheap equipment like this. Hey, Weddy, come here. Come get in the YouTube video with me. And what do you think about being on camera? Is it weird? Yeah. Why do you think it's weird? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's weird too. I'm trying to help people be less weird about it. What if you have a job someday where you have to be on camera? I would quit that job. <laughs> <laughs> so why even try? Well, the first and most important thing is just that it allows you to build connection with your students. Studies have shown that the more you can build a sense of social presence in your class, the better the learning. Second, video is just super engaging. You have so many more pathways to actually engage your audience, not just the audio, but also the visual. You can show things and demonstrate things. Eventually, you can even take people out into the world. And third, video is just going to make you seem more approachable. It'll humanize you and humanize your whole class. Hopefully, the more video you do, the more video your students will do as well. And that'll just create this synergy between all three of these elements. You'll all be more connected, that'll allow you to be more engaging with one another, and that'll also just make you more approachable, and all three of these things will just build upon each other. Whether we like it or not, this is our future. And if you want to do the very best for your students, you're going to have to overcome your fears and get on camera and start connecting and engaging and build that approachability in this online environment. I'm doing a video about how to talk on video. Come here and show people how you talk on video. How do you like to talk on video? 
Do you find it weird or are you okay with it? <laughs> so talking on camera can be super hard, but I want to give you five tips just to get started. Number one, try connecting rather than performing. Look right into the lens, but not at the lens. Look right through it to the people you're actually talking to. Imagine them there and just talk right to those people. Secondly, you have to give 125% when you do this because when you just record yourself in front of a camera, you don't have all that energy that you typically get in a social situation and you can kind of look kind of flat. You might find that when you watch your first few videos back, you just seem like kind of, I don't know, just kind of sad and quiet and not really energized, right? So I, you have to go a little bit above what you think is natural. Go to like 125% and it should look just about right. Number three, have a plan. I like to plan around what I call the five R's. The first one is you have to have a reason for the video. There should be a really strong why driving the video. Second is relevance. That why should be really clear to the people who are watching. Number three is resonance. You should constantly be connecting with the people on the other side of that lens and they should feel that connection. It should resonate with them. Four is rhythm. You don't wanna to spend too long on a topic or go too fast. You gotta have a nice pace that feels just right. And finally, number five is just be real. Just be yourself, be authentic, and be who you really are. Don't try to be anybody else. Four, practice. Practice all the time. You might want to start really simple just by maybe giving some video feedback to students or when students are doing an online discussion, pop in on video to respond to a student. These are some of the easiest ways to do these little tiny micro videos that can get you much more comfortable on camera and also increase your social presence on the class. In the class, not on the class. <laughs> All right, everybody just keep practicing and we'll get there. Uh, I look forward to our discussion today. We're giving tips on how to get on camera. Do you want to help? I don't know. I guess I would approach recording yourself on camera the same way you would approach, approach writing. Like you wouldn't expect like yourself just to write uh, like something that didn't need to be edited, you know, like from the very beginning. Mm. You, would, hmm. you would write a rough draft. You might write off the top of your head. And then you would use that and cut that down and edit it and change it around until it was just tight and how you wanted it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know why video work would be any different than, yeah. than writing in that way. All right, I'll, I'll um, field questions in the Q and A and we'll end kick it over to uh, Kim or VJ. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for that, Mike. I feel like it's such a nice, like concrete example, right? And in addition to giving us some tips. And so, yeah, I think we will just go straight into Viji and what she wants to talk about. Sure. Um, I'm a little jealous that I didn't make a video because <laughs> now I have to do it off the cuff. Um, I wanted to just Thank you all for being here, first of all, but I wanted to, to just pose this question to ask yourself, is a video necessary? Um, what is it that you are trying to accomplish with the video? Um, and it's great to make your own videos. I've done a lot of that, um, but there's also probably really good content already out there. Um, and so thinking about, is there something that you can take online already that's great content for your class um, and make that part of your course? Um, so don't feel like you have to make everything yourself. There might be some really great high quality resources that you can adapt. And, and I've heard some really creative work that faculty are doing with um, tools like Edpuzzle or Playposit where they're pulling in YouTube videos and then asking their own engagement questions throughout um, a, a lesson, for example. So there are ways in which you can customize how you pr present that information. Um, I also think it's important to ask yourself a question about whether the visuals are important because video does give you visuals. Some, for some of us, um, you know, it's enough to just hear. And so in that case, maybe a podcast or, or just having audio files available to your students might be sufficient. Um, I made the, the conscious choice because I am very self-conscious about being on camera to do the version that's kind of like the Khan Academy versions where there are screencasts, I'm working problems for my students, but they never actually see me in the video. They only hear my voice overlaid um, on the videos. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, but as you're weighing the options and thinking about whether or not you wanna make a video, um, there are advantages to having your own, right? So making your own video content for your students, it's exactly what you want them to hear and none of what you don't want them to hear, which can be hard to find sometimes when you're looking at information online. Um, and then I also think it's really important, and, and Mike um, commented on this, the social presence element, 
um, it's really important to think about the connection this fosters with our students. The videos that I create for my class, um, by far the most popular element of the course for my students. Um, and I think the reason that it's so popular is because it's, it's, they take me with them um, in so many different settings, right? Like if they're listening to my videos and for preparing for class, I'm in their dorm room um, explaining a concept to them or I'm outside on, or I'm in the bus with them. I mean, there's so many times we're connecting with them that we don't even, we don't even think about it, right? But that's where they're receiving the information. Um, and so it's really helpful to think about that as a way to connect with students, um, but also to give them the ability to rewatch. I mean, that's the, the most essential piece, at least when you're thinking about a technical course, or in my case, I teach a quantitative course, it's so helpful for them to rewatch content that they might feel like they need help with. Um, and so listening to it multiple times at multiple points in the semester is really, really helpful resource to have. So um, those are a few things to think about in terms of should I make my own videos and what are the advantages of it. So I wanted to show you some examples in my course. So the first um, the first thing I'm going to show you is just an example of how I laid it out initially for my students. It's a Google Doc and um, I have it week by week and then I list out the modules or videos that I'd like them to watch in that sort of center column. It says video links um, and I've given them some time um, estimates of the video length so that they can decide do, do I have a few minutes to watch a couple of them now? Should I watch them all at once? Break them up over several days. Um, and they are fairly short. I aimed for five minutes or less, although sometimes I got a little bit longer. Um, but what, it, what this does is it forces a novice to see a way to chunk the material. And I think that that's also really helpful for learning, right? So they understand, whereas if I had done this in a, a class lesson, 75 minutes might go by and they wouldn't have necessarily picked out the header toppings, for example. Um, so the, the topics, this, this allows them to see the topics and the structure with which we're working through the material. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And I did it as a Google Doc because I, I wanted the flexibility and it turns out to be great this semester to change the schedule on the fly and we're all on the same page. So um, that's the, the avenue I took, but a lot of learning management systems have great um, tools for um, creating a lesson plan that incorporates video links in it. So I would enc encourage you to look at your lesson, um, at your learning management systems for their plans. And then the other thing I wanted to do was show you an image of one of the videos that I um, share with my students. I have about a hundred of these short clips that they watch throughout the semester. Um, this one is a three minute video where I am basically trying to give them the conceptual understanding of what a standard deviation is. Um, I'm using a tool called Camtasia to create my videos. And what, I, what that tool allowed me to do was import some PowerPoint slides. So what you see on the left are basically the, the few different slides that I had. Um, so students can navigate either on the left to a certain portion of the video, or they can just use the time um, along the bottom to, to navigate to an area. And then I'm also annotating over some slides. Um, so this allows me to do some of the think aloud protocols that I like to do with my students and, and how I would approach a problem. So they start to hear the rhythm of me talking about how I would how I would work through a problem so that they eventually can sort of do this on their own. Um, so this is an example of something where I'm taking some content already on a slide, but adding some information to give it a little bit more, um, to, to make it a bit more dynamic. Um, and then I've also embedded some pretest and practice questions into these videos so students can um, answer a few questions before they get started to see if they even need to watch the video. Maybe it's something that they know from another content, another course, or they've reviewed it, or they've read the book and they feel good about it. Um, or, and then as well, a practice, what, what should they have gotten out of the, the video? So they're having a chance to um, interact in some way in the video. And so I found this to be a pretty helpful tool, and I think the students really appreciate having this resource to go back to. And what I can see from the, the learning management system is that they're watching this video not just in the class session right before this is being discussed, but they're watching it again before the upcoming exam, and then they're watching it again before the final, and then they're watching it in some random day about 15 weeks into the course, I have no idea why, but but it's something that they wanted to refresh on. Um, so this has been one of the more, um, 
advantageous aspects of the course to have these modules available. And the best part about this whole thing is I hate calculating standard deviation. So I never have to do it again because it's in this recording and I can direct them to the recording for an example. So it's a really great way for me to offload some of the more technical concepts that I think are less central to the course, um, but still necessary, some of those foundational ideas. Um, and, and hopefully um, I can replace that now with other materials I could do with them live, either um, in class or face-to-face -face online, for example. But there's a lot of things that it allows me to do as an instructor that I couldn't do before. Thanks so much, Vigie. Sorry, my, my unmute button got stuck, uh, which is classic. Um, Mike, did you want to um, add anything on to Vigie's presentation before we jump into discussion? Well, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of discussion in the Q&A that Vigie and I should probably both address about, you know, why five minutes and how does this fit into the overall course? Mm -hmm. And I think my first answer to that is just that you really do have to think of this as uh, the whole ecosystem of your full course and maybe you feel like a concept takes like you know 20 to 30 minutes to explain but you could still perhaps break that up into um, an introduction uh, some stories uh, or some some examples and things like that some applications and have each of those be a separate video it's really about creating searchability within your course so that you know, if, the, if they're chunked up, you're not having students dig in to find that one example that resonated with them. They can just see it as the thumbnail of that video and it's got the title there. It's just, it's just a way of chunking things up. It's not that you're doing everything in five minutes. It's that you're doing one thing in five minutes, but you're doing lots of those five minute things. <laughs> Yeah. And I'd add too that, I mean, we know from attention span literature that this, that we need to keep things short. Um, that modularity is also super helpful when you're, when you're considering um, creating the videos, because if I make a mistake in a 35 minute video, it's a bear to correct that mistake. If I need to re-record some aspect because um, new information has come in, um, it's, it's daunting to think about re-recording a super long video, whereas something short it's easy to think about replacing it. Um, it doesn't feel like a huge investment of time. Um, so that um, those chunks that we create for the students are also really helpful for us in terms of managing, um, creating the content. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really like about what both of you have highlighted here is the, the, the this particular teaching technique, right, has benefits on the faculty side in terms of engagement and management and all these things. And, the, and also benefits our students, right? I mean, it's such a beautiful connector of the, the relationship between faculty and students. Um, like Mike said, there, um, the, the Q&A board is just sort of lighting up. And it's, there are lots of buckets, I would say, of different themes that people are bringing up. Um, and a, a lot of follow-ups on the things that you've talked about. Um, but there is so much about production and how that it feels like it's worth our time to just spend a couple minutes here at the beginning and ask you two for you know what you would suggest um not just you know recording i mean you could just look through recording and light source and captioning and platform xyz so if if there's a way um if you two have a kind of magical short list of things that you might suggest to people i think it would really be appreciated you may go first to this. <laughs> so, so for, um, for a live production, uh, I think I demonstrated, I tried to demonstrate that even a cheap four-year-old cell phone can get a really good image. The most important piece is the light source. So you need like a really big light source, uh, like a big window. And I'm actually stuck in the basement right now. So you can probably tell I have like a harsh light source right now. Uh, and it's not great. This is not where I'd want to record a video. But when I need to record, I go up into this room that has all this light just, you know, sort of showering me with light. And then I can use a cheap camera and it still looks fantastic. Uh, so that's the image. Uh, a lot of people commented on the audio. I did have a $15 little um, lapel mic connected to me. Uh, if, it's a little trickier these days because a lot of cell phones don't have, um, you know, a, a standard connection, but usually you can get some sort of, um, uh, adapter or something and even the like 15 to 30 dollar lapel mics on amazon uh, make a huge huge difference uh, so audio is pretty important i think that makes it sound a lot more professional so that's on the production side um, once it goes into the editor i use davinci resolve which is 
completely free and it's astonishing that it's free because it's so good. I mean, this is what pros use, uh, but there is a free uh, version of it and there's no watermarks, nothing. It's, it's, a, it's a fully capable editor. It's fantastic. So, um, so I use that. I could say a lot more because we can go down a rabbit hole of production stuff uh, because I do a lot of other things too. I do animations and I, I do a lot of other things that require other tools. Uh, which I'm happy to get into if, if people are interested. But the short version is the production flow is just great light and then uh, and good audio and then uh, edit in DaVinci Resolve. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. I think because I chose the screencast option, the audio was essential for it to be very good. And I, I liken it to, it's an analogy for me, like if you are having a conversation with someone on your phone and you put them on speakerphone versus putting a headset in your ears. Um, if you can get a, a decent mic, and they they're not very expensive, maybe your campus even has some that you can borrow, um, they, it makes such a difference in terms of the sound quality and, um, and feeling very um, near to your listener. So I think that's one thing I would definitely say is essential. And um, for screencasts, of course, lighting source doesn't quite matter, but you do need to think about what you're displaying to your students and that it's high quality, that you're thinking about principles of good slide design, for example, um, lots of things that we know about how people are attuned to um, text for on screen, like those are the kinds of things you'll have to keep in mind as you're planning. Um, I think I would also add um, just your, your personal preparation for sitting down to do a recording. Um, that's something that, that is not trivial, um, thinking about when are you best ready to make a recording. For some people that might be after they have their cup of coffee in the morning and they're ready to go. For me personally, I have to kind of warm up to being able to speak. And, and as Mike said, that 125%, I can't, I'm not at 125% first thing in the morning. I have to go teach a class, for example, and then I'm really warmed up to do a short video uh, recording. Um, so that's, th those are things that, to ask yourself about when would I be able to give 125%. And it's a lot like when you go to a, a performance and that you notice that the actors and actresses, if you get up close, they've got a ton of makeup on, right? But, but you need that extra makeup in order to see those features um, from afar. In the same way that 125% is essential in making these recordings. Otherwise, you, you are gonna fall a little bit flat, even though you feel like you're doing it like you would have done it live. So you do have to give that extra. And when, when is it the best time to do that? And what resources do you need to have around you as you sit down to do that work. I mean, when I make recordings, it's a mess. I have papers all around me because I don't know what I'm gonna to wanna to pick up and hold in my hand at any moment. Um, and what you don't wanna do is get, get started on your recording and have to stop and go get things and come back. And you just wanna have it recording. And then if you mess up or you need something, stop talking just <laughs> begin again and you can edit out things that you don't want to have. So. Um, having those sessions where you just sit down and you let it, you just let it go. And if you, and for me, m most of my screencasts, I felt like I needed to do it almost twice. And the second time was the better take. Um, it was the one that I felt a little warmer. Um, I warmed up, but I also felt more conversational with my students in the video. Um, and that's the other part that I would say is don't feel like you're not talking to a person when you're talking into the camera. It feels artificial because you are talking to a camera, but eventually a listener is going to be there. So think about who that listener is and what they might like to hear from you. And also connect the dots about where this video fits in their curriculum. So be explicit as you're, as you're talking. A after you watch this video, we're going to spend time in X, Y, and Z, or you're going to have a practice problem set on X, Y, and Z so that they understand how this fits um, in your curriculum overall and that they know that after watching the video, they're not check done with the material and they don't have to do anything else for you, um, that this fits in a bigger picture. So I think those are some things I would keep in mind as you uh, prepare yourself to be thinking about creating videos. That's, a, that's lovely, right? It's a reminder that we are the, the part of the production, right? That has to get in there and be prepared. Um, if, it seems to me like this is a kind of natural segue. Uh, there's a question I think that's sort of interesting um, and goes along with this idea of engagement. Um, and it says, is it crucial to have a face on the presentation video for it to be engaging for the students? And I know we've talked a lot about video and then moved to screencast, but I know you two also have some thinking about um, other kinds of representations that could be given to students that are still engaging. Yeah, I, I think maybe we should start with, uh, 
a common thing that faculty do, especially in an emergency situation like this, is they take their PowerPoint slides and they just want to like sort of present them, right? So they read over them. And typically that's just audio. I think, you know, the, the sad thing here is that a lot of PowerPoint slides among faculty, because we're not trained in this, we're not trained in like the graphic artistry of all of this and, and, and all that, uh, they can, the slides themselves are boring. But if you're a dynamic presenter, maybe that's okay because you're because you're there and you being there makes a difference. I think when you pull that away, it can be really, really bad. And I think you know we're hearing from some students now, like frustrated with these long, you know, PowerPoint death by PowerPoint kind of things. So, you know, what are the options here? I think either you can make your uh, visual more dynamic without you being on it, and that could be done through uh, you know, it could be done through a screencast where you're actually writing down th some things that can actually be really exciting to watch somebody work through a complicated math problem. I mean, there's drama there. I think it's, it's, it's actually really interesting to watch that. And Khan Academy does that. And they don't, you know, uh, Sal Khan is not on those videos. Uh, and those are still really good. So I think that works really well. Uh, but I would definitely counsel against the idea of just reading through PowerPoint slides without being present in some way, like uh, without being dynamically engaged and present. Uh, that's that's my my general take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would say the same. I mean, I think if you're um, if you're putting in um, visuals that are not very helpful, then you don't even need the visuals. Just make it yeah. a podcast, right? And just do your lecture without the visuals, um, or make the slides available and just they can listen to it and watch the slide, you know, on their own time. Like you don't have to have it line up exactly. But if you do need animation and you do need um, some dynamic, as I'm working problems, or maybe you're having things overlaid, like if you need some of that animation in there, then then by all means use the video. Um, but I do I do caution against too that the death by PowerPoint is even worse as a recorded option, even yeah. though they can do it at one and a half speed. So at least there's that option. And there's closed captioning, which doesn't happen live too, right? So there are some benefits to being able to do that um, online. But I think that it is, um, you have to think about what the end goal is and what will best accomplish the end goal. And um, I find it really liberating to just have the screencast because I don't have to care about how I look when I sit down to make the recording. Um, I, you know, it's just about what I say and how I say it. And for me, that, that just took off a layer of complexity out of the recording that I didn't need to engage in. And it's, and it's actually been very beneficial. And in hindsight, I think it was brilliant because these videos are now almost 10 years old, but you wouldn't be able to tell it um, because the, the quality of the video, like the image itself is pretty decent, the resolution. Um, my voice hasn't changed much, you know, but whereas if I had done um, a, an, an image of myself, I, I've aged. Um, so there's certain aspects that are really, um, there's an advantage in some ways by, by thinking about some versions of videos over others. So I think that, that sustainability element, if you want to do this over and over after, after semester after semester and you don't really want to re-record content, then, um, then thinking about some of these animated um, options or having a whiteboard to write on is, is a great tool. And and can I just say a little bit about um, animation? And I'll also uh, mention, I'm working on a series of like how to videos that will come out over the next six weeks or so and I'll cover a range of different types of micro lectures including you know there's there's a lot of different ways to animate and there's a lot of paid options out there like Animaker and Toonly and Doodly and you've probably seen some of these uh, they probably show up in your uh, Facebook feed um, those are those are actually really great if you've got the money uh, but a lot of those things can be done and actually be done better in PowerPoint, and that surprises a lot of people, but PowerPoint has come a long way in the last 10 years. And you can do all sorts of really great animations. Uh, if you're curious, just look up, you know, how to animate a PowerPoint slide on YouTube and look for like some of the really cutting edge creators out, out there. And you'll see some really amazing things. And in fact, a lot of some of the videos that might be some of your favorite videos on YouTube that you're just like, wow, how'd they do that? You might be surprised that they actually did it in PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna mention that PowerPoint is one of the most flexible and best animation software like out there. Um, there there's of course more pro stuff out there if you're interested, but 
it's a great place to get started because it's already familiar to so many people. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to sort of drive the train a little in a di slightly different direction. Um, and I think there's a, there's a set of questions that are really about um, disciplinary uses for micro lectures, right? Um, and it began with a question that was specific to how might micro lectures help students with quantitative analysis, but we might think a little more, you know, uh, capaciously about that question as well, right? Do, do micro lectures have different applications or, you know, different benefits depending on which sort of disciplinary house you live in? Well, <laughs> Vigi, do you want to say anything about the quantitative stuff? Because I know... Sure, yeah. I mean, this is the easiest one, I think, for people to wrap their heads around because we all, in some form or fashion, struggled at some point with some mathematical idea. Um, so the idea that we might be able to rewatch something um, or take it a little bit slower or hit pause um, and re, and, you know, just play the last five seconds again. I mean, that's a, an incredible tool to have at our fingertips. Um, so I, I think that we can't underscore that technology has um, the ability that technology has to really help learners. Um, but I, I think that the um, that think aloud protocol that I was talking about or the worked problems, that's where I see my students talk about these helping the most is because they get to hear an expert talk through their um, their thinking process as they solve a problem. How do I know that this is the right approach to take with the problem? Well, I'll tell you as I'm working the problem. Um, and so then I, that voice becomes something that's ingrained in them and they start to ask those questions as they, that, as they form their own um, questions looking at a problem. So I think there's a lot that's really helpful for a quantitative course. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, just the idea that I don't have to do these mundane calculations in front of them, that let's, let's take all the things that are boring or hard and put them in a video lecture and let's make class time about application of some of the concepts. What can we, um, wh where can we go next with, with this now that we know this information? Um, and that's, um, a sort of a self-serving plug for just saying like, you can take stuff that you don't like to do and put it in a video and then give, give your students the chance to do the more exciting, the things that you find exciting about your field, bring that into your experiences with students um, because they, in the end, they want your energy and your enthusiasm for the content. And um, it's really easy to just say, I'll give 125% for this video one time rather than giving 100% 10 times in a row over the next 10 semesters, for example. Yeah, and I could give a very different example, and I think this is a, why we're a good pair for this um, thing here, because uh, in anthropology, we're rarely explaining uh, a concept. In fact, we're usually like presenting questions and presenting uh, things that challenge people. And I actually just want to expand the notion of micro lecture here, and maybe micro lecture isn't the right word. I, I just like short form video, because a lot of my short form videos are stories or question prompts or examples of students actually going out and doing the assignment that was assigned. One of our, I'd say one of the most effective ones I've ever done was just, I was trying to explain structural racism. And so I just went out in Kansas City and I just sort of, you know, just walked around Kansas City um, right across what's called the Truist Wall, which is, and talked about the history of the Truist Wall, which is essentially the line where it goes about 90% white to 90% black and talked about like, how did that happen and why did that happen? And, and actually like being out there on the streets and being able to show people like, this is, this is how, how it came about. Um, that turned out to be a very, uh, I think important video and very controversial. It obviously sparked a lot of conversation. Uh, somebody else mentioned like, how do you keep this stuff from going beyond, you know, do you, uh, the question is, do you recommend we develop policies that students aren't allowed to copy or post those videos to other platforms? Um, I think that that could be a good idea depending on what you're talking about. Um, in this case, I actually wanted to sort of give to Kansas City a short history of how this happened uh, in the community. And so I put it out uh, publicly. And I think that was actually really good for the community to actually talk about structural racism in our own community and how that happened and what can we do about it. Uh, so it's up to you. I think, I think there's like a real uh, opportunity here. Uh, on the one hand, I think we need to have these quiet spaces and these sealed off spaces where we can work through ideas and that kind of thing. 
But I also think that there's a real opportunity here as faculty get better with video to educate the public and to uh, share our ideas more broadly. So I'm actually kind of really excited about people learning more video. Uh, I think there's a lot to be, I don't know. I, I, I think there's, I, I think we're, we're only like halfway to where we could be in terms of uh, sort of excellence in how we present ourselves to the world as academics. And I, I hope that this sort of pushes the envelope a little bit and we all start um, engaging the public with some of our knowledge more. Uh, Bitch, do you want to um, follow up at all on this question about, I mean, I think of it as distribution, right? Like, um, and Mike's notion of the sealed wall of the classroom is kind of an interesting one. Video has a spreadability um, that other, you know, that our syllabi might not, or that our PowerPoint certainly probably don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's a totally different content area, so it's not the same. Like, I could... I could share my calculations of standard deviations with the public, but I don't think they really need mine. Um, so it, it, it is different, but I do want to, I know that we have listeners who are in a variety of disciplines. Um, so just thinking, just thinking about what you have to offer. Um, some of it is unique to your courses and you want to be private to your students, but some of it might be, as Mike is saying, some of it might be an opportunity to educate a, a broader group of people, um, people who are not within the walls of our classroom. And why not, if we have the opportunity, why not create resources that others can use? Um, I think this is a great opportunity to give um, our knowledge and our lens in which we see the world to, to others. Um, so I, I agree. I think the enthusiasm for this and, and having more people have the skills to do this um, it, it does allow you to think really deeply about who education could be delivered to. Mm -hmm. um, and it, this seems like sort of a, a nice segue into the question of access too, right? Because now we're thinking not just about access, making sure that all the students we have in front of us in one way or another have access to the content that we're giving them, but really access on an incredibly broad level, right? Access to anybody who has, um, who can access a video link. Really, um, I know that people had some questions um, about sort of captioning and that sort of thing. Do you two sort of have that in the back of your minds as you're planning and creating content? Absolutely, accessibility is something you'll wanna look into very early on um, in terms of any format that you choose, if it's animation, if it's screencasts, um, thinking through how will they be captioned, how will audio or, or transcripts might be available. Um, I think those are really important things to consider as you're planning for recording and figuring out what your software allows for or what you might be able to add on after the fact, right? So we know we can bring something into YouTube and add captioning, but oftentimes we have to go in and actually see if the captioning is correct. Um, it, and especially for technical terms, it's often not right. So <laughs> you'll have to go in and, and make corrections to the captioning. Um, but um, for example, on our campus, uh, we have some some people who that is their, their role is to sort of help us think about how to create more accessible content for our students. And so I can work with someone to say, here, I made this screencast. Can you help me with um, providing the captioning or other, um, any other resources that are needed for accessibility? So I would work with individuals on your campus. Don't feel like you have to do everything, the editing, the, you know, all of this, there's so much that could be done all by yourself, but it doesn't have to be done all by yourself. There are, there are people on your campuses likely who have expertise, who can, um, who can either offer you time or resources to figure this out. But I do think that the accessibility issue is one you're gonna wanna face very early on as you're making decisions. Yeah, and I'll just mention a couple of resources for that. Um, one is there's a ton of closed caption creators. Some of them are free and some of them are paid. Um, the paid ones actually, are uh, generally better, but there, uh, there are some good free ones. And then rev.com, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of that, but it's, uh, it's like a dollar 25 a minute to have somebody actually caption your stuff, which isn't that bad. Um, it's up to you. Uh, for me, that actually makes sense. I, I wish my university was paying for it, they're not, but uh, it, can take a, it can take me an hour to caption, uh, say a 10 minute video. And I generally I'll, I'll pay like 15 bucks to get that done by somebody and just spend my time doing other things. It, it, I don't know, it's, it can be a tight call, um, but rev.com is uh, kind of a cool thing. If you have teenagers, 
uh, it's actually an interesting job that they can do because rev.com is sort of like an Uber of closed captioning. And uh, if you have a teen who's trying to learn how to type, uh, it's a great way to get them learning typing and they get paid like 75 cents a minute or something like that. So. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I wanted to add too that um, I think we sometimes think of closed captioning as something that only certain individuals need or want. Um, and so then we start to question if we should put that kind of effort into um, such a select percentage of people who might need it. But that's a, that's a great example of one in which um, it's not just people who, who might not be able to hear, but it might be people who, for whom English is a second language and having those words on the screen actually help them understand the material better, right? Um, so there's, there's a variety of students um, who could use these accommodations and even ones that we're not necessarily thinking of um, at the forefront when we're planning this. So um, just keep that in mind as well. There's also a lot of students, you know, on a subway or something and they just don't have their earbuds with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, that's me a lot, right? <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so having closed captions are essential for all those reasons. Um, this, this question feels to me almost like the, the sort of flip side of this question about captioning and it's actually about copyright. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people are sort of asking questions, um, uh, not just about, you know, your own productions, but also using other people's in your courses. Um, and then I love this, this additional one, right, which is do your students ever object if you use someone else's content, a, a video that somebody else has produced or a micro lecture uh, that somebody else has produced um, it, with the expectation that you should, in fact, like Vigi said, do it all, do everything. Um, so I guess it's copyright, but then also sort of student reactions when you bring things into your courses. Yeah, I, I, I uh... I have in mind like that I need to create a chart of sort of when to use somebody's material and when not to. Um, you know, in general, I think there's no problem if you're using uh, somebody, say like five or 10 minutes of something that is really presenting a very unique idea to, that's unique to that particular person presenting it. So in a lot of cases, TED Talks are, I think are okay. Uh, whereas Khan Academy stuff crosses a different line because that's like explaining concepts and you're almost just letting Khan teach for you at that point. That's, that one's a little trickier. I, and I don't say necessarily I'm against that, but I think that's where students kind of start to uh, feel like, hey, wait, who's teaching me here? Is it Khan Academy or am I actually being taught by a professor? Uh, in my field, it's quite a bit different because, uh, you know, there's not like this fixed body of knowledge necessarily that has to be transmitted. And, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, math and things like that. It's, uh, it's a lot of ideas. And I think in that sense, sometimes it's okay to present somebody else's idea as long as you're also there engaging with the idea as a professor and, and guiding students in, in thinking about how to engage with the ideas. So it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. Did you yeah and I, I, I share the same idea because I actually have some colleagues for whom they share. So they work together to create video contents so that they share across sections. And that could be a great way too, if you've got if the thought of creating all the videos by yourself is overwhelming, maybe you've got um, some peer, some colleagues who teach similar courses where you could um, share the load of doing that. But I think it's, it is very important to be careful about um, the perceptions that students might have about whether or not you're teaching the course um, if you're not creating the videos. Um, I, I think it works well if you have some, obviously, creating your own videos, they're not going to question if you're teaching the class, although they, they might say, well, why are we doing this in a video versus in class? But if you're always presenting someone else's materials, I think it's ex especially important to share why those materials are, are useful for your students and to make sure that it is catered to your class as best as you can. So maybe there are some follow-up questions after they watch the video that are created by you for them so that they see that this is just part of the resources. because none of our students object to having a textbook written by someone else that they need to read through and then you ask them to engage with the material. But they will object to watching Khan Academy videos all the time if you don't actually ask them to do something with those Khan Academy videos. Um, so I think that's, that's the difference is really thinking through how will it be received by them if it's always someone else who's presenting the materials or presenting the videos. Um, 
And as much as you can customize it, and, and it can be as simple as embedding some questions pre and post the video, um, that will help them to see that this is, you have put your stamp on it as something that is part of your course materials, even though you didn't create it yourself. And, and I think this also gets into a question about how do you present this stuff and what does it look like, say, inside a course. So I'll just say, um, I'll typically have like um, 10 micro lectures per week and those range from five to 20 minutes each. And uh, they're usually represent 10 big ideas. Like each, each micro lecture introduces some big idea. And those will be in a, in a Canvas module. So if you can just imagine there's a page for each one and each video is contextualized. So I basically say like why this is important and then here's the video. And then there's you know, some quiz stuff uh, kind of embedded in uh, that module as well. Um, but then at the top of the module is the introduction. And that introduction is just uh, me talking about all 10 videos they're gonna watch and talking about why they're important. And I'll show maybe a short clip from it and then talk about why, the, or I'll just react to it sometimes. I don't necessarily just have to talk about it. Sometimes it's just like a mind blowing idea and I'll just react to it as a mind blowing idea, you know? And, uh, and so they watch that video first. It's typically like 10 minutes and that, that kind of gives them a sense, okay, this is why we're watching all these. And then they go through them and we have discussions and quizzes uh, intermixed with all of that. Yeah, and I, I have a similar kind of structure where I might do a very short overview of the videos that they might watch for a lesson. Um, and, and I would do something like three to five short videos that they'd watch for a class session and we meet twice a week. So it's a roughly the same number of videos overall. Um, again, no longer than five or six minutes if I can avoid it. Um, but I would caution you um, as you're thinking about this and as you're creating the content to keep that in mind as your overall course time for the class. So, um, you know, in our, when I talk to students, I say budget six to nine hours per credit hour or however, however your campus thinks about the outside work that's required for a, a typical course. Put this into that outside work that's required for the typical course and don't burden them. Don't think just because I can offload this content that I can now add more and more and more and more on top of that, that this is, this is part of what you're asking them to digest as part of the course. And you may need to adjust as you go. You might need to gauge as you're delivering the content um, through a video format, like maybe the homework assignments need to be shorter because they really do need to have the time to watch the videos. Um, so thinking of the overall time that's required for students is important as you're planning that out. And then also I would say before you get too far along in recording the videos, make a few and then ask some people about <laughs> how it's going. So maybe ask a colleague who's created videos or what, ask a few students who maybe you have some connections to that you could say, can you give me some feedback on the videos? Because what you don't want to do is get down the line of making, you know, 50 videos and realize, oh shoot, I should have. And this is, this is partially the lesson I learned, right? I should have learned to write much neater in those videos, right? So just trying to get some feedback early on so that you can um, move forward re with recording more confidently as you, as you prepare. You know, you two, this has been like this incredibly wide, I mean, wide ranging conversation, right? For something that is, that is ostensibly a micro lecture, the number of, the macro number of topics that you've managed to give us some insight into has been huge. Um, I just wanted to ask if you had, you know, out of all of that that we have talked about, is there sort of one little digestible nugget that you want to make sure that people walk away from this with? Uh, mine That's would be my, my, mine would be start small but dream big. Um, I you know started just by doing really simple video responses and doing like little um, just welcome pieces, uh, and then I started sort of watching people on YouTube uh, for inspiration, really like vloggers and whatnot. And I started realizing like, oh wow, these are maybe like the new professors, they're educating millions of people and they're doing it really, really well. And they may not have like PhD next to your name, their name, but some of them are really outstanding educators. And so I started taking notes and uh, I sort of see my career developing over the next several years more and more toward the video platform. Uh, and I just spent my whole sabbatical the last uh, three months in Southeast Asia making videos about um, Buddhism and 
Hinduism and uh, just different things for my world religions class. And I think video is a huge part of our future as faculty. I think it's kind of like the new lecture podium. And we all, it took all of us a lot of time to master lecturing. It's gonna take all of us a lot of time to master video. Uh, but, you know, start small and dream big. And um, yeah, and like I said, I'll be doing like some tutorials and you can sort of follow my progress. I have a long way to go, but um, maybe we can learn together. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I think I will just say to be kind to yourself as you're making these videos. Um, I There is not a time during any of the editing I did to those videos where I didn't say, is that really how I sound? Is that really how I, you know, in this case, I didn't look at, but but we're going to do that. That's normal human behavior to, to be a little bit squeamish um, looking at ourselves in this way. Um, and that it's exhausting to do this work. It is different than standing in front of a classroom because you're talking to a machine and imagining you're talking to a future person, right? And you don't get any of the cues that you get when you're in a real live conversation with someone. Like, do they really get it? Is this explanation helping? Um, so you're really, like, you're doing all this mental load as you're recording. So be kind to yourself because you're gonna feel tired even recording just a five minute video. Um, it sounds like something you could just fire off really quick and be good and with and, and go off, but, and in reality, it's probably going to take you a long time to make that five minute video and you'll get better at it. It will go faster and you'll feel like you need less preparation for yourself as you do it. Um, but give yourself that um, permission to feel tired and exhausted because you're bringing your 125% into it, doing all of that preparation and not getting that feedback or cues that you might get in a real conversation. Um, and so this, that's the part that I'd say as a, as a person who, when, you know, when we teach and we are looking at those faces for confusion, or we're looking at those faces for affirmation and you don't get that in a video, um, it can be really hard to do. So, um, just, just go forward knowing that it is hard and that it will get easier as you practice it. And your students will love this resource. They will absolutely love this resource. I, I cannot underscore that enough because of the accessibility, because of the ability to rewatch to at any point, at any time you are, you are with them whenever they want to pull up that resource. Um, and it's such a good investment in your bank of materials for students. You can pull in content from one course into another so seamlessly once you've created these videos. Uh, I, we are running out of time, but I cannot thank the two of you enough for being so incredibly generous with your experiences and honest and compassionate and hilarious about sharing those experiences and your insights that you've gathered through doing this work. I mean, I don't think we could walk away with something better than start small, dream big, and be kind to yourself as people sort of venture into this. So thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, for those of you who are um, hopefully going to join us um, on the discussion board, if you have had questions that have not yet uh, been addressed, you can continue the conversation. We'll have a recording of today's discussion and a transcript and a lot of the resources that have come up today at our website. And there's also a discussion forum, which will be moderated by those of us at AQ and our experts. So please give us a visit and continue to add your thoughts. Um, and then finally, as we're closing, a couple of quick uh, thoughts about resources. So those of you who are familiar with us at AQ know that our mission is student success through effective instruction, which we've talked a lot about today. We know that many of you might still be looking for online content that serves the really varied needs of your students. And one way to serve that need is through open educational resources. Those are the ones that are free and don't require passwords. And they're available in a variety of locations and digital formats like videos, for instance, worksheets, assessments, etc. cetera. Uh, our colleagues at OpenStax specialize in these and you will see a link to their website on your screen. If you're not familiar with them, OpenStax is an initiative housed at Rice University, and it's committed to improving access to quality learning materials. They've developed a variety of resources that include more than 20 educational technology products, as well as subject specific lists of teaching and learning resources, and they're all available for free. Our last thing about additional resources, we just want to remind you that everything we've referenced today is available at the AQ website. 
um, in addition to resources from our partners. And we'll post all of these links on our wrap up page following the conclusion of today's webinar. And we are going to invite you to join us on Monday for our final webinar in this series. And it will focus on engaging students in reading and micro lectures and will feature Flower Darby, Ludie Goodson, and Katherine Harris. So thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Please stay safe and have a terrific online class. Good luck.